All right, everyone, hope you enjoyed your coffee break. Uh, we will now have uh, the panel discussion where we will be discussing outlooks uh, and opportunities in single cell protein analysis. Um, and at this point, I'd like to invite our panel, uh, Nikolai Slavov, Verlitza Masson, Peter Sogar, and Jeff Navala to come up uh, and take their seats up on the stage. All right, so obviously this field has come a long way in, in the past couple of years since um, it really emerged and since certainly since the first single cell proteomics conference, it's really cool to see how far the technology has developed, um, but still a lot of opportunities to be had. Uh, and so I'll start the questions with the panel to just ask them um, what they think. And of course, we've uh, assembled a panel of experts with expertises in kind of different areas um, from mass spectrometry trometry to protein sequencing um, to affinity reagents. And so we're going to get some unique perspectives. So I'll open the questions up maybe with Nikolai and um, just ask, what do you see as areas for kind of the most fruitful further development and opportunities in the analysis of um, protein molecules and single cells? So in terms of opportunities, I think the proteome remains a vast unexplored ocean. We have generally looked at the proteome through a very narrow lens of hypotheses. A lot of times these hypotheses come from sequencing nucleic acids. And recently we've come to appreciate that these hypotheses as while being tremendously useful are actually much more limiting than I thought in the past. So I think the advancement in technologies that can allow to do the novel sequencing and mass spectrometry traditionally has been able to do this for decades, but the novel sequencing is generally uh, much lower throughput and much more challenging to do. So emerging opportunities to make these approaches much more standard, much higher throughput, and to use them to analyze signaling in time with the current generation of technologies, I think is incredibly exciting from perspective of, of basic fundamental research and understanding biological systems. And clearly there are many biomedical uh, applications, both in the area of more basic understanding, but also in clinical applications, in identifying markers, disease mechanisms, being able to make therapies much more specific, uh, as, as Peter Sorger was explaining, the importance of knowing which are the membrane receptors that cluster together so that uh, their co-detection can be used to increase the specificity of various therapies. Uh, there, there, is, there are a lot of exciting opportunities in that direction of harnessing the new generation of high throughput, but also less expensive per sample basis methods. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, so I realize I have not actually spoken, so you may be wondering what on earth I'm doing. So I work on PA3 kinase signaling, and I'm particularly interested in signaling over time. And Nikolai sort of already alluded to this. Um, I think one dimension that is really important when it, when it comes to actually making sense of the vast amount of data that we're collecting is this aspect of time and how do we make inferences about what information is being transferred in protein networks. And so I think there's also a huge opportunity for collaboration more generally across technology. So not just single cell proteomics or uh, PTM measurements, but thinking about how we combine data sets across modalities to build reliable models across scales. And so that means integrating across scales, right? So proteomics, transcriptomics, epigenetics, and also understanding what are the key measurements we actually really need to capture in order to get the most information about a system. And sometimes that may be a small list of proteins. Olga was alluded to this, alluding to this yesterday, that uh, perhaps it's more important to measure a few things, but measure them really, really well and make sure that those things are the important uh, ones to measure. So for me, really, it's understanding what types of measurements contain the most information about the biology that we're interested in. So I would I would certainly agree with this sort of integrative approaches, particularly you can see how in genomics, as these methods have become easier and easier, it becomes possible to take a whole series of them and combine them. But let me highlight something slightly different, which is I think also the possibility of taking these more advanced measurement methods into more complex physiology. So uh, if you look at 
let's take two examples. So one of them is mouse models, right? So you, the gem mouse models are very sophisticated now, and yet you'd be amazed at how simple the measurements that are made. You know, maybe there's a little blood measurement. If it's a tumor study, somebody calipers the tumor, or maybe it's been given a, 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 a luminescent tag, um, but really very little sophisticated analysis is done. There's some, you know, exceptions in proteomics, people like Forrest White. So um, I think there's just an enormous opportunity to to take these perturbational systems, either drug drug studies or um, or genetic studies in animals and actually bring much better measurement methods to them. And the same thing exists also with humans, right? There are large human cohorts out there and um, we don't tend to study them with a whole lot of sophistication. Uh, and I think that actually there's a big opportunity for basic science discovery in looking at uh, at, at human biology and saying, aha, you know, this, this is what's related to a disease area, but that then highlights a specific set of molecules that I might be interested in. So, um, so the integrative aspect, yes, but I think also trying to get away from cell line studies into these more complex pieces of physiology. Um, I think from the perspective of a single molecule protein sequencing approach, um, I mean, I think the, 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 the grand vision, right, is, is sort of a, a de novo sequencing, and I think that really lends itself to new discovery methods that are new, uh, new means to discover uh, beyond uh, what you can do with antibodies or, or mass spec, um, discovery-based biology, and even if, so I think, you know, sort of in the near term, even if, if you're able to do single molecule sort of fingerprinting uh, of proteins, um, just sort of offering a new, um, a new lens to see proteomics through um, that's beyond mass spec or beyond antibody-based methods uh, could sort of, you know, open up uh, give you give you a new angle into 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 your proteomic samples and also sort of maybe possibly democratize uh, the technology more. Um, you know, if we're thinking about something like nanopore sequencing that sort of enables potentially uh, individual labs to to do uh, uh, you know uh, more more uh, proteomics at scale um, uh, in in their own hands compared to you know doing a mass spec facility or something like that. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to expand a little bit upon what um, Peter was um, discussing and to just ask, so you all have kind of areas of your own expertise, but given the current state of the technology, both, you know, the costs and scales in terms of what measurements are uh, possible, what data sets um, would you like to see generated that are currently like within grasp of um, the technology's abilities that have, you know, yet uh, been generated that could provide a lot of insight kind of uh, today without, you know, more sophisticated technological advancements. Uh, yeah, I, I can just start from from my own perspective of developing nanopore-based protein sequencing. Um, we think we sort of have a, and I'll talk more about it later today, but we have a working system right now where we can, you know, pull proteins through a pore, we can generate these really complex signals. But right now, the throughput of our of our particular approach is relatively low. Um, and to be able to sort of make more sense and push towards de novo sequencing, we're going to need much larger d uh, data sets to train these deep learning models, which have been essential for pushing nanopore-based DNA sequencing, the accuracy of those uh, systems up. So so for us, it's it's getting much larger data sets on, on lots of different complex protein uh, samples would, is, is what we're pushing towards. You know, I think a data set that would be interesting would be for any either phase three human clinical trial or for a drug that's already out there. Let's take, uh, you know, an immunotherapy drug, work out actually what it really does in a patient and why for any given indication do only half the patients respond. That would be a good success and half the patients do not, right? So I think there's a, it's a very simple question and underlying it is a very simple sort of immunological or if it was... BRAF inhibitors in, in, in cell signaling, for example, a very simple molecular hypothesis, but we don't even really know the answer to that. And, and what's interesting in those cases is all the expensive part in principle has been done, but the data that we need is locked away. Uh, and this is what we've discovered in our case. If it was an industry-sponsored clinical trial, the specimens are sitting in a freezer somewhere and never will be accessible again. So there's just a sort of extraordinary amount of data that you could get access to, um, but is just not being made available. Thank you. Um, very much agree with what has already been said. Um, I'm sort of a very simple basic scientist. So one of the things I would be really uh, interested in having access to is a wide range of 
data sets from specific cell types. So single cell proteomics, cell type specific single cell type single cell proteomics, if you like, because what we really need to make sophisticated mathematical models of the systems that we're looking at are really measurements of uh, molecule, molecular numbers, uh, and to contextualize the seed our network models. And that's something that I think would be a fantastic resource uh, to, to have access to. And then of course, moving forward, if it becomes possible to measure post-translational modifications at scale, that will be fantastic, uh, particularly if it can be multiplexed, I think uh, will be a major advance in the field, um, at least for from the basic science point of view, I think there is a big hurdle to be overcome to be able to make all of these technologies that we're talking about um, widely used in the clinic for a variety of practical uh, limitations, but it, they're not insurmountable, I think. My dream data set, there are many of those, but the one that I'm going to tell you about overlaps a little bit with what Ralitza suggested. And I think with current technologies, it's actually quite feasible and approachable to quantify very accurately and very comprehensively post-translational modifications, even of classical signaling pathways, such as MAP3 kinase, PA3, and so on signaling, where we can try to build much more detailed and quantitative understanding of how they work. Ideally, if we can add some subcellular resolution and specificity to where that signaling occurs, that will be a really exciting data set to explore and delve into. And you know, part of this, I think, is what we're all kind of doing here today, discussing these ideas and and getting the you know know how about new techniques and everything out there. But um, if you all could just expand a bit on things that you think are uh, impediments or barriers to the generation of kind of these different data sets that you've all outlined, having interest in, and and um, what things can we all kind of actively do as a, maybe as a community to you know accelerate the progress of um, you know generating useful data with these uh, technologies. I'm going to start very quickly with an impediment that I see as being rather substantial and that in fact motivates in part the organization of this conference. And this is knowledge sharing and awareness of what technologies can do. I oftentimes find very smart, very knowledgeable biologists thinking of mass spectrometry being at the stage where it was 10, 15 years ago. And they, and Getting that understanding is remarkably challenging because we guard our knowledge behind high bars of jargon and abbreviations and very technical papers. We are all very busy following up what happens in our fields and subfields and having the time and the luxury to delve deeply to understand another field. I think that is surprisingly hard. Um, I absolutely enjoyed and loved the conceptual presentation that Peter Sorger gave earlier this morning. Uh, and I understand it at the conceptual level. It still remains a challenge for me if I wanted to follow up and do many of those things in my lab. If I'm lucky, maybe I can collaborate with the Sorger lab or somebody else who can do them or Ralitha. But I certainly would need that guidance to know what, what are the challenges, what is possible. And in the case of mass spectrometry proteomics, I feel that this lack of knowledge is a huge part of what limits the realization of what technology has made possible. Yeah, so Nikolai sort of took my, uh, what I probably would have highlighted as well. I think siloing is a big issue across the board in terms of, yeah, interdisciplinary silos. Um, also, just generally speaking, not even just about the technologies, but particular experimental workflows, the basics, for example, if you're looking at signaling, how do you process your samples? If you, you're looking at, if you want to capture metabolites, you need to process them in a completely different way and so on and so forth. And I think uh, we generally lack the, but there are tools out there now or, or platforms like protocols.io. And I think more of us should be using those and sharing our protocols and methods. It takes a little bit longer, but actually it benefits the community at large. So I think that type of knowledge sharing is important. And of course, raising awareness. I think there is also something to be said about uh, data processing. Um, and so I think we need to acknowledge data scientists much more than we do mathematicians, statisticians, because uh, the complexity of the data sets that we're getting nowadays are is enormous. And I think there is a real risk that people start running workflows that are just not fit for purpose and that potentially could even be giving up erroneous results. And I think that's a, a real danger, especially now with AI and things being trained and publicly available data sets. So um, yeah, 
more more sharing of knowledge and also uh, more appreciation of the sophistication of the quantitative approaches that are needed to to analyze and process all the data that we're gathering. So I want to pick up on the idea of uh, of, of sort of knowledge and information sharing. I think that's that I completely agree with those thoughts, but but I think I think it's actually just not realistic for any one of us to to have a lab that spans you know five of these advanced technologies. And so I think one of the challenges we have really is with collaboration, is how we do collaboration. And uh, there's a lot of language out there about it, but I have to say as yes, as the oldest person up here, <clears throat> the old white guy. Uh, um, I have to say, it's gone. It's it, it, the culture for collaboration, particularly among students and postdocs, is ever stronger. I think most people enjoy collaborative science. We know. Uh, I had a conversation a little while ago about somebody who was trying to set up, you know, imaging in their lab, and I thought, you know, should be able to just send me those specimens, and we can do them. Um, but the the infrastructure for collaboration is getting weaker and weaker and harder and harder. And so, you know, for my lab. Over the years, the grants that are open-ended, you know, collaborative that you can sort of imagine, they're going away, and uh, we're corporatizing more and more research. So, um, I don't know how much everyone else feels that here, but things are very milestone-driven. Um, grant cycles are getting shorter. Uh, there's, it's very difficult to take a new technology and fully develop it because the notion is everything's a startup, right? We have this kind of startup entrepreneurial culture where everything gets three years of funding or five years of funding and then it's finished, right? And um, I've seen that both in the EU and the US. And yet, bringing a new technology, you know, like true single cell mass spec sequencing to bear is going to take a lot longer than three years or five years. So I think, I think actually, we need to challenge the way we fund and organize research to make collaboration a lot easier. Uh, and, and I think that is a big barrier. And so the result is that even though technologies become more diffuse and you know sharing is better than it was 20 years ago, only a small number of labs can actually mount really sophisticated biological studies and it's ever narrower. Um, so, so I think that's something that you know I wish our institutions put more attention on. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add. I would I would echo echo all of that. I think knowledge sharing, and I would say from from my perspective as a, a technology developer, uh, would be needs sharing, um, right? So I sort of have an idea of 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 the hammer that I'm building um, and what the nails might be, but I don't know maybe what are the best nails that I should be focusing on right now. Um, and I think through collaboration is where you can really uh, uh, figure that out because there might be sort of the grand vision, right? I imagine the technology, but there might be questions that I could address uh, right now using using this approach. So, so figuring out what those are, I think are really important, but it's been really hard, hard to do. <laughs> I want to follow up on what Peter was saying. Of course, I very much agree with it. It resonates just to clarify that even for collaboration, there is a bare minimum of knowledge of knowing what is possible before you initiate that collaboration. And oftentimes, even that bare minimum of knowledge that one can actually quantify certain level of abundance of proteins is lacking. And therefore, people who can very much benefit from doing types of analysis don't because they don't know they're, they're even possible. And then, of course, there is a level of expert knowledge of actually performing it, which is much more challenging and not necessarily for each and every lab to, to have the required expertise in all fields. Yeah, I, th I think this issue of specialization and its role versus, you know, widely disseminating the technology is really important, especially for, I mean, there's a lot of technology development going on, uh, people working on that at this conference. So I guess uh, as a follow-up to this you know, fruitful avenue, do you have any advice for people maybe developing methods um, to kind of walk that line between, you know, how much should I, you know, put in the effort to, you know, make my technology usable to a broad audience or how much, you know, at what point do I decide this is a really specialized thing? I, you know, I don't have the, you know, I can't really see a path to simplify this uh, in a big way in the near future um, versus when they really should put a lot of effort into making protocols widely available. Um, and do you have, so do you have any advice for how to, you know, navigate that line? And also um, just as a follow-up, do you see any interesting roles for, you know, vendors to, you know, what's what's the role for people who are providing uh, te like technologies from a company standpoint to assist um, in this process? A lot of really good questions. So just quickly try to touch on some of the points. So my perspective is to make 
each and every method as simple as possible. Unfortunately, the simplest methods sometimes are not simple enough. They still end up being complex. But I think from the very beginning, we have to be really ruthless with our ideas and to root out those really complex things that are only going to work once in a decade and nobody would ever want to use them again. And, and that also relates a little bit to the highly specialized method. If you're developing such a method that will be difficult to adopt, you better have the idea, the resources, and the capacity to really apply those methods to answer important questions. Because as a, from the perspective of method development, if it's difficult to adopt, then it's going to have very limited impact. Uh, and then on the other side of putting effort to make methods available, what I think really helps is the realization and the culture that this is deeply synergistic and pays back to the people who develop the methods. Of course, it helps very much those who adopt and use them for their research, which should be the driver and a good motivation, but also helps tremendously the method developers because they make a real impact and this is appreciated and helps them uh, obtain resources for the next thing that they would like to do. I'll pass on the microphone because I'm sure the rest of the panel has many things to add to this great question. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, so I'm going to address the question about making your methods available and whether you should invest time in that. So uh, my answer is very biased. I have a conflict of interest because I do write pieces on open science. And so the answer is yes. And I would say I wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't done that. The only reason I sit here is because Nikolai came across my uh, preprint and my openly available protocols. Uh, and so I think, you know, um, the culture is changing and I think that's a good thing. Um, one of the barriers to, obviously it's a lot of, it takes a lot of time to make methods openly available and protocols openly available. And one of the barriers of course is the incentives within our funding system. What are you actually being rewarded for? Now I'm based in the UK and not in the US and um, I'm quite happy to see that our reward structure is actually slowly changing. So these things are now being rewarded uh, in the UK when we apply for funding, et cetera. And actually our grants now are moving towards seven year cycles. So that's also a positive thing exactly for the reasons that uh, Peter highlighted. There is uh, increasingly this realization that you cannot actually make methods really rigorous method development without having the time to do so. And so I think that's a positive. And the more we talk about this and the more we influence funders to change the incentives, I think it's the more important that is and will allow people to actually make their methods possible. Of course, there's also the saying that uh, as open uh, as possible, uh, as closed as necessary. So of course you can have IP restrictions and you may have commercial interest and those need to be taken into account. And that's obviously a very personal sort of decision on the basis of what you're actually doing. But as a default, um, my advice is um, make it available, work with people, collaborate, it will benefit you. Three quick thoughts. One is, yes, we absolutely need vendors because you asked about vendors, right? We don't tend to build our, you know, we might innovate a bit in instrumentation, but I remember back to when labs had machine shops in them, right? We just don't do that much. And so we're hugely dependent on instrument vendors, right? Um, on the other hand, number two, is I think you, you mentioned protocols.io, which is great. We use protocols. I think though the shame of it is it's now been bought by a commercial company and that happens over and over again, is that we build these open science tools and then no one, no, no, uh, government or no foundations are willing to support them. And so they become privatized. And so we create public knowledge that then becomes private. And I think it's fine to have private knowledge, but I, I sort of resent having put all that time into, you know, protocols.io and now have it turned into a proprietary product. So um, I think we need to think about that. Um, um, you know, and then the, you know, the last thing is just, it is again, this, this question of open science really, I think is most of us are committed to it. It's, it takes quite a lot of effort, right? And so I think the NSF in the United States actually did an estimate of this because for physics, and they estimated that taking a physics project, because that's they do a lot of physics, and actually turning it into a generally useful data set cost about 20% of the total cost. If you look at CERN, for example, almost 50% of their total effort goes into data science, data curation, et cetera. So I think, again, uh, in, if we want those things in biology, we're going to have to invest in them, uh, and, and then, then we'll have them. And at the moment, it gets done largely for free. Uh, and, and free doesn't really exist. Um, 
from my perspective and coming from the uh, single molecule biophysics community, uh, I can say that most researchers um, sort of historically are using really bespoke instrumentation that they're building custom in, in the lab. Um, and so that it presents a huge barrier for, for other groups that, that might want to adopt these approaches. So uh, one of the things that, that we did starting my own group is we're using all commercially available, uh, uh, the nanopore plat the nanopore sensors that we use are just commercial off the shelf, uh, nanopore arrays that, that anyone can, anyone can purchase. And, and it's sort of, it's, it, it's definitely been a trade-off with us. Like, I think we could make more progress if we, if we kept to these, you know, custom nanopore rigs that I was trained on as a PhD student, we have a lot more customizability that we can do. We can tune the pores. We have access to different parts of the system, um, the electronics and things like that. But, but. Yeah, from my perspective, I think going towards these uh, commercially available uh, devices um, has would really, really lowers the the barrier of entry for for other groups to to adapt uh, these approaches that we develop. And uh, we've had a lot of fruitful discussion. I guess I wanted to also open up to the audience if you have any questions uh, for the remaining minute or two. Feel free to kind of raise your hand and and um, pitch in any thoughts uh, that you might have. I think the uh, you know the issue that you pointed out between the effort it takes to make the science um, open versus you know how useful kind of that data is is a really interesting debate and certainly you find a lot of people kind of um, if you're having discussions on Twitter or something you know some people there's one end of the spectrum which is you know it's a waste of time and you know, people are unlikely to reuse the data if it's meaningful the analysis will be reproduced. Um, and on the other side, you have people saying like everything, you know, make everything free or make everything open, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think it's interesting to see kind of the diversity of opinions on on this that that exist. Uh, and so I guess I encourage all of you to discuss that with the panel members um, in the next uh, at the next lunch break. And um, if no one has, I guess, any additional quote. Yeah, we have some questions. Sweet. Hi. Uh, thanks. It's not related to the data sharing or anything, but I was just curious as to most of the talks that we have seen here are um, either cancer, human, or mouse-based uh, studies. I was just curious to see how uh, what is the status of single-cell proteomics in other species other than human or mouse? Sample preparation. There is recent work in analyzing. The main challenges in that regard are really related to sample preparation. They're very hard to set up. Proteins. And the other aspect is that some proteins of certain bacteria are smaller and challenging to analyze, but they're not impossible. That means that the cells can be scanned and analyzed in one of the Yeah, I think there was some reason. Oh, yeah, we. Thanks. I, I remember when I got a, 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 a U54 grant in 2003, it told me that uh, I would have to put my data in a, a place after finishing for seven years. So I called my vice president and I said, so uh, please send me the count number for, for this, because I didn't think I was responsible for my grant to do it. It was because I didn't submit the grant, the university did. Uh, but uh, a colleague of mine, Jake Chen, um, has just got a U54 to build software to allow you to uh, take your data and more readily put it up into da into uh, data depositories because this has been a it's a sweat for many of us you know to actually work out a scheme for how do I get my data up to a place where NIH can uh, comfortably have it spread. And so somebody needs to write that software and make it much easier. So Jake has got that responsibility with two, two other people. I think somebody from the University of Colorado and one from UCLA. So I hope that's coming. It will make the job a little bit easier for everybody. Um, kind of to piggyback on that point and to kind of get your thoughts on it. So.
letting this platform work. Uh, I wonder if it's part of it was due to like the sheer amount or the sheer size of your chip or like what's the like how do you tell Yeah, thank you. Great question. Actually relates to the previous point too. Uh, historically, obviously, data size is has been an issue. You know, now with cloud computing, it's it's accessible if relatively expensive. Um, that's not actually, in my experience, the biggest challenge. Actually, the challenge is really making the data usable, right? And so putting unusable data up for, for others is not so hard. And it's all the curation that goes into, you know, you've got a big spreadsheet with all those columns. What do all of those columns actually correspond to? And you would like to have an ontology, a defined ontology that tells you what these things are. And if there's been a processing step, you want the algorithm, you know, that's the whole concept behind, as you know, it behind fair data analysis. Um, and so one thing we realized in our own lab is um, we've, we've tried to implement a concept we call born fair. Um, which is what you generally do is collect a whole pile of data and then it's time to publish it or to submit your U54 report. And then you try to put all the metadata on and it's archeology span is really hard, right? So putting that investment up front to record the information, we all know we're all nodding our heads. It's relatively hard. The only smart thing we did in, it recently was we hired from Simmons College right next door, a person who was a lib an expert in a library and data science. Uh, and uh, her, her project for her final master's thesis was actually at Tufts. And she told me she dealt with historical documents, maps, an elephant's tail, and um, and and then I think a bunch of physical artifacts. And I said, that sounds just like a lab, you know, an elephant's tail, a couple of old glasses and stuff like that. So so I think it's actually that curation and making the data organized. Um, and what's interesting is from sequencing data, it's sort of simpler, right? There's a big genome and you got to line it all up and that's that. When you get to perturbational data or time series data or different cell types, there's actually quite a lot needed. So I think it's actually that both the, concept behind curation and the curation process is the harder part at the moment, not the technology per se. Yeah, I just wanted to add to this because I very strongly agree with Peter. And I think one of the things we're perhaps missing in this field in particular is, I mean, I kind of hate the word atlas because there is an atlas in nature every week. Uh, but I do think that we sort of need a more accessible way of exploring all the various proteomics data sets that are being uh, generated, particularly now at the single cell level, and for people to browse them and to actually use the information that's contained in, in that data. So maybe there is a bit of a task for, for, for the community, but I think that will be uh, really, really useful. Um, and, and another thing that, so I've got Sidney Brenner as one of my scientific heroes. And so he had this saying about we're drowning in data and we're starving for knowledge. And I think it's really important to think about asking a question before collecting the data to ensure that whatever data you're collecting actually has a purpose and is useful. One thing that's being discussed a lot in the UK in relation to data storage is actually the amount of uh, energy that it actually takes to store all of these data uh, sets. And so it's becoming increasingly more important to think about. And it's something that our funders back home actually now put into grants, how you consider the environmental impact of data storage. And so, so I think it's just something to keep bear in mind um, because it we are generating more and more data and we need to make sure that data is actually useful. Um, Thank you. Well, the, I'm very much enjoying this discussion, but unfortunately we are running out of our time for the panel. So let's thank all the panelists. And the moderator. <laughs> Great.